chance to learn these from him would be instrumental to the future program about school. Uh, we still have another lecture of Ari Turner and so Chicago lecture will only be for one hour from 2 to 3 p.m. We'll take a 15 minute break and the second lecture this afternoon will be from 2 to 3 until 4.45 p.m. So that's the plan. Let's see if we can stick to it. But before he does, I have uh, two mundane announcements, but it's important ones. The one is make sure you bring your ID. They won't let you into the event. I'm certain you won't be able to bring it. You mean the barbecue tonight? For tonight, yes. Not to our place. The second thing is, yeah, your poster set, posters up. Please remove them, you know, in, by 6 o'clock. Okay. All right. So uh, welcome back. So um, so uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about three-dimensional topological insulators. And um, and again, we got a lot of mileage in the two-dimensional case thinking about the edge. And and we were by thinking about the edge, we were able to think about what kinds of possible bulk states we could have. So let's take the same approach to thinking about the three-dimensional uh, case. So in that case, the boundary is the two-dimensional surface, which I can describe in a two-dimensional Brillouin zone, Kx and Ky. And again, the important thing is that there are these special points in the Brillouin zone where K and minus K are the same point. And um, at those special points, you know that any surface states, if you had them, um, would have to be Kramer's degenerate. But in general, as you move away from these points, in general, there will be some perturbation that's induced, say, by a spin orbit interaction, which will lift that degeneracy linearly. And so actually, these time reversal invariant points are all uh, uh, Dirac points, where um, the Dirac point is um, protected by time reversal symmetry. Okay. Now, that in and of itself is, is maybe not so interesting because, um, of course, um, you know, so you have lots of Dirac points on the surface, okay? But that doesn't mean that the surface has some guaranteed uh, conducting states because those Dirac points could all be below the Fermi energy, okay? And, and, and the band, so what's interesting is how do the different Dirac points at the different time reversal invariant points. The question is, how do they connect to each other? And so last time we saw there, there were two possibilities. So we could either, they could connect uh, like uh, this, or they could connect like that. Okay, and so, so if you look along any of these um, uh, pairs, then uh, the picture is gonna look like either like this or like this. Okay, and so um, it's a little bit richer than the two-dimensional case, okay, where the edge only had two time reversal invariant points. So, um, so maybe you can see that there, there's, there, there's sort of more possibilities, okay? And so in fact, what um, uh, uh, is the case is there are four um, uh, Z2 topological invariants that characterize the, um, the, uh, the you know, a, a three-dimensional uh, uh, topological insulator. Okay, and um, so let me just sort of walk through the various possibilities. So of course, there's always the trivial possibility that every pair looks like this. Okay, so, uh, so one possibility is a trivial insulator. Okay, um, the next possibility I wanna um, think about is um, I want to th let's try to think about how, how we could build something non-trivial up. So one way of building uh, a, a non-trivial three-dimensional state is to do the same construction that I showed you um, uh, uh, the day before yesterday um, that I used for the, uh, for the integer quantum Hall effect, which is to just stack layers of, um, of two-dimensional materials to form a three-dimensional material, okay? And so, um, So this is what we call a weak topological insulator. And so let's think about this a little bit. And so here, what I can imagine is I take a bunch of two-dimensional topological insulators and I uh, stack them on top of each other to form a uh, three-dimensional material. Let me call this the uh, Z direction. 
And so then, uh, you know, in the limit that they're not coupled to each other at all, it's obvious that you're going to have some sort of um, uh, uh, surface states running around the side of this crystal and, and nothing on the top. Okay, um, and so if I look at the side, then um, I can, uh, if I draw the surface Brillouin zone as a function of um, kz in this case and say kx, then, um, then what's going to happen in this case is, um, so each, each, so when they're, in, in, the, in the case where they are completely decoupled from each other, then everything is independent of kz. And then I just have a, you know, I have the, I have the, the, the one-dimensional helical states that, that sort of look like this. And in general, there will be a Fermi surface, you know, at, at, at some plus value of kx and some minus value of kx. And so that'll turn into a Fermi surface that looks like, like this, OK? So, um, so what I have is I have a sur fer surface Fermi surface that, um, that divides the Brillouin zone into two pieces, um, uh, which each enclose two of the, um, of the, of the Dirac points. Okay, so the Fermi surface Okay, now, um, of course, you know, this is the trivial limit where I, um, where I don't have them coupled together at all. Once I start coupling them together, then the bands will start depending on kz, okay? But the picture's still basically going to look like this. Um, maybe um, the Fermi surface might, you know, uh, uh, wiggle out a little bit, okay? But it'll still basically look like this, and in this phase, um, uh, you know, the surface uh, uh, you know, involves two, um, uh, encloses two Dirac points. Okay? Um, and so, uh, so how might we characterize this? Well, you know, let's think about how we characterized the, um, the, uh, the, um, the layered integer quantum Hall states. So the way we describe them, you know, we have a churn number on each layer, and we could turn that in, you know, the layers define um, lattice planes of your three-dimensional crystal, and those lattice planes are indexed by reciprocal lattice vectors, okay? And so in the three-dimensional case, we, asso we, we associated the sort of triad of churn numbers that tell you the churn numbers on each set of layers with a reciprocal lattice vector, okay? And it's really going to be the same story here. Um, so, uh, uh, because, you know, you could have, you could imagine uh, topological insulators stacked in the z direction, the x direction, or the y direction. Um, and in each of case, there's going to be a Z2 invariant for that. And so, um, so the weak TIs can have three Z2 invariants, which um, I can, uh, you know, imagine uh, forming a, um, a kind of reciprocal lattice vector where this reciprocal lattice vector, it's a, it's a vector on the reciprocal lattice, but um, uh, that reciprocal lattice is only defined mod 2, meaning that um, uh, any two uh, uh, vectors that differ by twice a reciprocal lattice vector are identified with each other. So I can call this um, a uh, sort of mod 2 reciprocal lattice vector. Yes? Zero energy, does the Dirac, and you go, you deviate to finite KZ, does that gap out the Dirac one, or is that a Dirac one? Well, so let's 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 look at the one-dimensional case. So so uh, so if I have the one-dimensional case, in general, I have some uh, my helical states are gonna have something like that, and there's nothing that says that the Fermi energy is gonna be exactly at the Dirac point, okay? So the Fermi energy in general will be someplace like this. Okay, and then I have two Fermi points. Okay, and if, and, and, and if I stack that and it's independent of KZ, then I'll have these straight lines. And those, those are these two points, just sort of extended in KZ. Okay, now what will happen if once I turn on couple, you know, of course, of course, if I don't couple them at, uh, at all, everywhere along this line, I have this. I have this. This crossing. The moment I turn on coupling, then that degeneracy will be lifted everywhere except these two points. 
because those remain protected by time reversal symmetry. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay. So, so how might you think about evaluating uh, these um, uh, 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 three Z two invariants? Okay. Um, so, uh, so again, it's useful to um, to think about the um, uh, sort of think in terms of this extreme limit, okay? And this is just a crutch I'm going to use to make it easy to think about, but it's, it then it's easy to see how it generalizes. Um, so, uh, so what I can do is, so let me now draw my um, three-dimensional, let me make a little bit of space here. So now I have my three-dimensional Bro1 zone, which you know goes from minus pi over a to plus pi over a. And um, so uh, let's see if I can do this. How's that? Okay. So the the, the point the, the point I want to make, okay. And let me. Um, so so um, so the three dimensional Brillouin zone has planes in it that are invariant under time reversal. So one of the planes is is this plane, which sort of cuts through uh, zero. K z equals zero. Okay. And the other plane is uh, this plane, which cuts through k z equals pi. Okay, and each of those planes is just like a two-dimensional. You know, if I think of the Hamiltonian, which is a function of kx and ky on this plane, it's time reversal invariant. Okay, so it's just like the Hamiltonian of a two-dimensional system, and and in particular, it has the four, it has the four time reversal invariant points, and this one has uh, the four time reversal invariant points as well. And um, so, uh, so the way I can now, now if everything is so, so, so each of these planes is characterized by a two-dimensional z2 invariant. Okay. So um, uh, uh, now, in the in the in the case where um, I'm in the weak topological insulator, where I can where a starting point for thinking about that is the case where where I have uh, independent layers. Then what I know is that you know uh, in that case everything is independent of KZ, so that this layer will be the same as this layer. Th this this plane will be the same as, as this plane. So for the weak topological insulator, what we expect is that the Z2 invariant in the KZ in, in the KZ equals zero plane will be the same as the the the, the uh, Z2 invariant in the uh, KZ equals pi plane. Okay, so. Um, well, so certainly this is the case in this limit. So it's continuously connected to that. Okay, and 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 you know, uh, so so if I start here and then start turning up the coupling, in order for that to stop being the case, I'd have to go through some transition. Okay, and then it wouldn't be a weak topological insulator anymore. So, but that so what that suggests is that um, if I want to talk about uh, nu z, which is the one that characterizes the lattice planes in the z direction, then what I want to then what I want to do is I want to look at the uh, the the k equals zero plane, and that's going to be the same as the nu in the k z equals pi plane, okay, and that's going to be my uh, nu z. Okay, so so um, uh, so that will be my um, my uh, uh, this uh, uh, one of the z two invariants. Okay, so likewise I can do this in the x and y direction as well. Okay, and so um, so the same thing I can do here and here. Okay, um, and you know one thing that you have to convince yourself of is that if you uh, come up with some other funny lattice direction 
that that's not independent of, of, of these three. And really, it's for the same reason that it was in the, in the uh, layered quantum Hall effect problem. There are really only three independent uh, invariants for these layered problems. Okay. So, okay. Now, um, so, but of course, this is not the most interesting possibility. So what this immediately suggests is, is that it should be possible. Oh, pardon? Okay. Oh, one thing, and, and again, one thing I want to, let me make the point about this, which is that um, this I can think of as a product of over, over this square of my four deltas. Okay, and, 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 and likewise, this one, this, and, and, and so the, 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 the product of the delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, that's going to be the same as this product. Okay? So. But Charlie, does it mean if, you, if all three are non zero, you have, you have a weak topology invariant, all three non zero, that can, those are Miller indices that define plane? Say the 1, 1, 1 plane. The 1, 1, it, so therefore it's, you can. Think of that three-dimensional topological insulator as a stack of layers continuously connected to independent stack of layers, one, one, one layer. Exactly. But not the other one. Not well, what? it could also be continuously connected to one, one, three, okay. because it's only defined mod two. Okay, good. good. Okay. Can you get a relation between the three views? No. Right, but they are they are in fact independent because in fact I can construct I can construct these in each of the three directions. Okay. Okay. So so this leads to the next possibility, which is the strong topological insulator. And, and for many reasons, this is the more interesting uh, case. Um, where, uh, so you see, it's possible for uh, this product to be different from this product. And if that's the case, it's obvious that it's impossible to construct that by, by just simply layering 2D um, things. Because by, by construction, if I do this layering process, um, uh, these two have to be the same. Okay? And so that suggests that there's an invariant um, let me call it nu zero, which is equal to uh, you know nu of k z equals zero times nu of k z uh, equals pi over a. Okay, and let me define my nu's so that they're plus or minus one. I suppose. so so um, uh, and uh, and if this is equal to minus one, so that these are um, uh, so that these two, these, this products are different, then that's what I will call a strong topological insulator. Now, now you might ask, well, um, you know, could it be that I have the product in the x direction um, be negative and have the, you know, and then I could do, I could do the same thing for kx and for kx and for ky, okay? But in fact, um, those have to be the same, and, and from, this, from this construction, it's clear why that has to be the case, because um, what this invariant is, in fact, is the product over the entire cube, the, all eight of these, um, you know, eight. Okay, it's the product over all eight deltas. And it's clear that it doesn't matter whether you do it, whether you break it up into the, uh, you know, kz equals zero, kz equals pi, kx equals zero, kx equals pi, or ky equals zero, ky equals pi. There's just a single strong topological invariant. Okay. And so what this uh, uh, topological, so you, what you can see is that we, uh, we had the possibilities for the trivial insulator. Of course, in the trivial insulator, um, all of the news are equal to plus, you know, are, are trivial. They're equal to plus one, okay? Um, uh, uh, and we didn't enclose any surface states. It, we didn't have, the, the, there was no Fermi surface on the surface. So it encloses zero, if you will. Um, uh, uh, in the case of, of the weak TI, we enclosed two. And so in the case of the strong TI, the Fermi surface encloses 
one or three. Though, of course, you can't say which one is because you know, who's to say what the inside and what the outside is? It's either one or three. So for a strong TI, the, um, you have a picture which the simplest version of, you know, so. Simplest version, so I have, again, my, my four points. And the simplest version is that I have a Fermi surface that looks like this. And closes a single uh, Dirac point. Okay? So, um, so, so this one is special. So in this case, what you have is you have, if I look at the, uh, as a function of energy, you have a, uh, you have a Dirac cone. So that's the Dirac cone here. And then you have, you know, your Fermi energy, you know, uh, cuts through here. And, and, and this is the only thing you have happening at the Fermi surface. Or it could be, at least, the only thing you have happening at the Fermi surface. Yes, on the physical surface. Okay. And, you know, unlike on the weak topological insulator where some of the surfaces it encloses, you have, you have surface states that enclose two, and some of the surfaces, you have surface states that enclose zero. Here, every surface, it encloses an odd number. And that odd number is not equal to zero. So, you, so, you're, so, you, so you're guaranteed to have these surfaces on every surface of your uh, topological insulator. Yes? What was your argument of distorting that sheet into a circle? Distorting the sheet. Well, I'm not. I'm not distorting. I'm, it's, this is so. So this cannot be distorted into into this. So this is this is different. Um, and uh, uh, so um, you know, uh, maybe it's not too surprising if you imagine. You know, what do you have to do in order to get from this to this? Well, what you have to do is you have to flip one of these deltas. Okay, and you can imagine flipping one of these deltas, and then something is going to happen, you know, at one of these points. And you can imagine that will be the Fermi surface sort of pinching off. Okay. Yes? Well, because I know, so, so are, you, are you content with believing that I have a Fermi circle? <laughs> no, I mean, so I mean, so 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 I mean, that was that was what we were just asking before. So so if you believe the Fermi surface encloses one of these time reversal invariant points, then that's the answer, because because this time reversal invariant point is a Dirac point. Of course, there's a Dirac point here, here, and here as well. Okay, but the point is, is that these Dirac points. Are, 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 are not participating in the Fermi surface, at the surface. Okay? Now, of course, you know, uh, I could imagine this Fermi surface growing and getting bigger and bigger, and then you could imagine it pinching off and turning into something that looks like this. So you could say, well, there it's enclosing three Dirac, three of these points. That's that's kind of the same. Okay, so I can't I can't tell you which of those it's going to be. Okay, but what I can tell you is that the Fermi surface divides the Brillouin zone into two pieces, one of both of which have an odd number of Dirac points in them. Okay, and so and that property is very special because um, if you think about it. Um, you, you remember um, uh, what you know. Uh, so when you have a Dirac point, um, a Dirac point is characterized by a pi Berry phase. Okay, and that pi Berry phase is very um, is very special. And, and in fact, the fact that the Berry phase going around the Fermi surface can only be zero or pi that really is a consequence of time reversal symmetry. Okay, um, it, so the only choices are zero or pi. So in this case. It's zero, okay, and in, and 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 so uh, um, so this case, uh, from the point of view of the um, Berry phase, it's the same. It's just as good as having nothing, being a trivial insulator, okay. But for the strong topological insulator, when you you, you enclose an odd number of these, you get an odd multiple of pi. 
Okay. And so for that reason, yeah. Uh, so it looks like in this case when you, when you have a non-trivial strong invariant, the weak units aren't, aren't even defined. Well, no, they are. They still are defined. Yeah, they are. You see, because, because um, so even when the, the product of the four, so, so think of it in terms of the, uh, the, the, the product of the deltas. Even when, you know, this product and this product disagree with each other, um, it's still well-defined to ask, what's this product? Well, so you have to make a choice. So, so, but if you choose, so maybe a natural choice is to choose the one that doesn't enclose the origin, that doesn't include the origin. Okay, that's a, that's a well-defined, you know, if I have to decide, I have to make a decision, that's a reasonable decision to make. In, I'm going to define my weak topological invariant uh, in, you know, when the strong topological invariant is non-zero. I'm going to define that to be the planar invariant in the plane that doesn't include the origin. Okay, and, and, and so, um, uh, you know, and so, so, so all four of these invariants, nu zero, nu x, and nu y, and nu z, those are all independent invariants. And in fact, they're the only invariants. I don't think I've, I probably haven't proven to you that, that, that there are four and only four invariants, but um, I'm not gonna even, I'm not gonna try to do that, so yeah. Yes, you necessarily get pi. And the fact that you get, or, and so you can think of it in two ways. You can say that the strong topological invariant guarantees that you have a surface with a, with a Berry phase of pi, and that in turn guarantees you have a Dirac, it encloses a Dirac point, because you can't shrink down pi to, zero, to nothing. Okay? Um, or you could say the surface guarantees an odd number of Dirac points, which says the Berry phase is pi. I mean, so they, they both go together. Well, no, but th what is the invariant? You know, the number of points. No, but, th but I want an invariant that characterizes the bulk, oh, okay. right? I mean, that, so that's the invariant that characterizes the surface. And then, it's you know, the bulk the boundary surface. correspondence tells you that the, the bulk so. determines the surface. Yeah. Their sense, the, the, so, so there's, this one is strong in the sense that um, uh, um, if I only require time reversal symmetry, this one is impossible to kill. You see, the weak topological insulator, let's suppose I have time reversal symmetry, but um, I allow myself to change my Hamiltonian. And so in particular, what I can imagine doing is doubling my unit cell in such a way, so I put on a perturbation, which is, say, plus, minus, plus, minus on these layers. That's a perfectly valid perturbation to put on, okay? If I do that, then I fold this Dirac point back to, to zero, and then they can kill each other. And I have nothing left, and I can have a trivial insulator, okay? So, so in a sense, the weak topological insulator relies on more than just time reversal symmetry. Okay. It also it also relies inherently on the translation symmetry of the of the lattice. Okay. And um, and so uh, um, now of course I used I used blocks theorem and translation symmetry to build up this tr strong topological in insulator. But in fact it is stronger than that. Okay. So for instance you can ask the question: Is it possible? Um, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, let's suppose, you know, any real crystal isn't going to have perfect translation symmetry. You know, just like in the quantum Hall effect, right? You know, you, you want to be able to have disorder. And, um, uh, and so you can ask the question, you know, so what I argued to you for the, uh, one, in, in the, for the, for the edge states in the two-dimensional case, I showed you that even with disorder, those edge states remain protected, okay? The same thing is the true um, of, these, um, of, these, uh, of these surface states. Okay, and and so one can understand this from um, uh, from different ways. Um, one can do a perturbative um, uh, uh, calculation. 
And, and so, uh, so in two dimensions, what one typically does perturbatively is one does an expansion in powers of KFL, and then one has the weak localization correction to the conductivity. Okay, and that's, that's the uh, term which in an ordinary two-dimensional uh, uh, metal drives you to the localized phase. The, um, you get a logarithmically divergent uh, cor correction to the conductivity due to weak localization. And so what you find in this case is that um, due to the pi Berry phase, there's a minus sign. And that minus sign changes the sign of the weak localization correction into weak anti-localization. So it makes it a better conductor. Okay? So that's an argument that's perturbative. Okay? But in fact, one can come up with a non-perturbative argument, which I don't have time to, 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 to give you, which basically argues that, um, uh, that, that these surface states, if I, if I imagine putting it on a, um, if I imagine putting it on a, uh, on a thickened donut, so I imagine my, I, if I have a, um, if I, if, I, if I have a three-dimensional donut and I, you know, cut a hole down the middle of it, okay? So then I can have a three-dimensional system. It has a t an inside surface and an outside surface. And so um, one can construct an argument that guarantees that the states on the surface have to know about the fluxes through the holes, okay? And, and it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a state, it's, it's, a, it's an argument that says that as a function of the fluxes, the states have to do this sort of zigzag pattern as a function of the fluxes. And that guarantees that the, um, that the states on the surface cannot be localized. Because if they were localized, then they wouldn't know about the fluxes. They, don't, they have to be able to go all the way around the circumference in order to know what the flux is. OK. All right. OK, so these states are robust in the same sense that the states of the, of the, one, of the, of the two-dimensional uh, topological insulator are robust. Um, and, light, and, simil and, and similarly, they also are impossible in purely two dimensions. So you could ask yourself, could you have just a single Dirac point, uh, you know, a, a band structure with a single Dirac point in, in two dimensions? Like remember, like graphene. You know, graphene, though, has, has four Dirac points. Even if you did spinless graphene, it has two Dirac points. You can't just have one. Okay? Um, and so there's a doubling theorem that says that in two dimensions, you can't have a single Dirac point that's protected by time reversal symmetry. Okay? That's impossible. Okay? But the topological insulator allows you to evade that doubling theorem by having the two partners be on the top surface and the bottom surface. So, so just like in the quantum Hall effect, you're spatially separating the, um, the doubled partners. Okay. All right. So, um, so as I've said several times, you know, these Dirac points are nice. Um, they're fun. But, um, uh, you know, um, they're even more interesting um, if you can think of ways to kill them, OK? Um, and so, uh, so, so, uh, so it's interesting to think about how you can kill the Dirac points in a topological insulator um, by lowering symmetries, OK? And you can get to interesting situations by lowering symmetries. So, um, so one symmetry you can, you can uh, lower is uh, time reversal symmetry. So let's imagine we break time reversal. So there are a couple of ways you can do that. One way you can do it is you can just put it, you can uh, um, uh, put it in a magnetic field. Okay? Um, so put it in an orbital field. And so this leads to, uh, to a uh, surface quantum Hall effect. OK, and uh, so Pablo told, told us about, about, um, about Lando levels for Dirac fermions. So, uh, so you, if you have a, a single Dirac cone, just like uh, in graphene, if you uh, put on, on a magnetic field, then it splits into Lando levels. OK. Um, and uh, in particular, what's interesting is that there's this zero lambda level, okay, which in this case is non-degenerate. Okay, so remember in Pablo's case, he always had he had four 
uh, 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 zero modes for the four Dirac points in graphene. Okay, and what was interesting to him was how they split. Okay, and there was this puzzle that you know he uh, uh, came up with, which is you know how do you think about how do you think about how do you think about this? And and so um, so uh, so in particular, you know what you know is that. Um, uh, the, you know, if I imagine changing the Fermi energy, the Hall conductance changes by E squared over H whenever you pass through a Landau level. But this is kind of symmetric. Okay, so you expect that the, the, uh, the, the, the Hall conductivity at plus, you know, chemical potential should be minus the Hall conductivity at minus. And so the only way out of that is to say that sigma xy is equal to E squared over H times a half integer. Okay, and so uh, so does this mean that you have a uh, fractional integer quantum Hall effect? So this is a um, this is a uh, a puzzle. Okay, so. This should be against the rules. Look, the integer quantum Hall effect always gives you integer multiples of e squared over h, okay? And you know that that's got to be the case because, the, because it's always edge states. And edge states always carry integer uh, multiples of e squared over h. There's no edge state that can carry half e squared over h for, for, you know, for, for, for non-interacting electrons, okay? So, um, so, so how do we get out of this? What's the resolution? Um, the, uh, the resolution is a basic fact in, of geometry, which remember, we're talking about the surface of a topological insulator. Okay? And uh, so the resolution is that the surface can't have a boundary. Okay, so boundary squared equals zero. Okay, so what you can do, of course, is you can uh, what you would do is you could have a slab, right? So that's what you that's what you do. So yeah, but the thing is, the slab has a top. And it has a bottom, okay. And this this theorem in geometry says that you can't cut the bottom off of the top, okay. And so um, so the top is going to have a uh, you know uh, e squared. You know if I if I if I put this in a magnetic field, the top is going to have some maybe e squared over two h. The bottom is going to have some uh, e squared over two h. But what you're going to measure is these two in parallel, and they're going to add up to an integer. Okay, and so, um, but uh, uh, the top and the bottom uh, on the side are going to share a single uh, chiral edge mode. Okay, and so, um, so, uh, so, uh, you know. Um, this is how we get out of this uh, violation of the theorem that uh, one half is not an integer. Yeah, it's it zero lambda level plus a symmetry under you know that 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 you know particle hole symmetry basically. That that's the you know one way of, of thinking of it. Um, uh, but another. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are various ways you, one can think about this one half. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get, the get fucked up by that. What, what if you have not a slab, you know, a thick slab, and you put your contacts only at the top and the bottom? You know, so you, you you put it always at the top. Yeah. No, not at the top, but at the edge of the top surface of the slab. Here. Here and then on the other side. No, Here. No. Here. Yeah. So now, and then you take the bottom. Yeah. Well, then though, you're going to have a metallic state on the side. Okay. So, so it's not going to be gapped on the side. So basically, what you're going to have on the side is you're going to have many, many channels, but you're going to have one more left mover than right mover. Okay. And how do you localize this? 
Um, I think the only thing that's guaranteed is that there's a single unlocalized chiral mode. I think that's the only thing that's guaranteed. You see, because if you break time reversal symmetry on, on you know, in general on, on these, and, and we are breaking time reversal symmetry, then in general things can become localized. And, and as much, and, and, and you could localize as much as you could, but the thing you can't localize is this one chiral edge mode. Okay, and so maybe if you have a thick, if you have a thick, um, a thick thing, it's interesting to think about how that chiral edge mode is distributed uh, around the thickness. And that, yeah, I'm not, I don't quite know the answer to that, but yeah. Yes. Maybe, but maybe not. I'm I'm sorry, I don't I don't understand what you mean. Uh do not get totally a magnitude of zero axis and only at the at the top box. Right, that's what we're talking about though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, you could do that. Well, that's an interesting thing to think about. So, um, uh, so in you know, it, it's kind of hard to do that with a magnetic field. It's kind of hard to have the magnetic field go through this but not go through the bottom. That that's a little bit hard. Okay. Um, but what you can do is you can imagine instead of um, applying an orbital field, you can imagine um, applying an exchange field, a, a Zeeman uh, field. Okay. Um, And this is something you can imagine doing just on the top. Okay? And if you do it on the top, then, uh, then let's think about what happens. So there, I'm not, I'm not doing a magnetic field, so I don't have the Landau level problem anymore. I still have a band structure. I still have a, a, a surface electronic structure on the top. So I can talk about my Hamiltonian for the surface, which is going to have this uh, you know, Dirac form. Okay, but then uh, breaking time reversal symmetry allows me to uh, to um, to to open up a mass, so there can be a mass term sigma z. Okay, and so what this does is um, yeah, instead of having a Dirac point, what I end up having is I have a mass. You know, I've opened a gap uh, in my uh, uh, in. In, in my Dirac point, okay? Um, and so, uh, so, so this could happen, um, and so this gap state, you know, and this, this state with a mass really is kind of the same state as you have if you, um, if you, uh, if you have a quantum Hall state like this, okay, with the half integer quantum Hall effect. Okay. So this state would again, you know, sort of locally on the surface, you could think of it has a Hall conductivity of, six, of, of e squared over 2h. Okay. Um, uh, so the interesting thing that you can do then, though, is to imagine, let's, let's just work on the top of my uh, Ti. I could imagine making um, uh, a region where I have some, uh, uh, a mass which is you know, a, a magnetic, you know, I put some magnetic material which has some, some magnetic, you know, breaks time reversal in some direction, so it has some magnetization. And then uh, I could put that next to um, something where I have the opposite magnetization. Okay? And then, you know, what this is like is this is like taking this and, uh, and just unfolding it. Okay, and so what you know is going to happen is that on this domain wall, you're going to have a uh, you're going to have a chiral mode. Okay, and so this is something that you could see explicitly by looking at this because this what this uh, domain wall is between m up and m down is precisely a domain wall where this mass changes sign. 
Okay, so it's the problem we've been solving over and over again, and it's not so surprising. And it, in fact, it's exactly the same problem that I showed you that we that we solved when I did the the, the uh, surface the edge state and the Haldane model. Okay, so you get you get this um, you get this uh, uh, chiral edge mode on this magnetic uh, domain wall. Okay, so this is what happens if you break uh, time reversal symmetry. There's another symmetry you can break. Yes? Okay, then you, then you have, then you have, um, then on the top surface you have a gap and on the bottom surface you don't. But there's no problem with having fractional integers along the whole No, no, because, uh, because the bottom surface doesn't have a gap. So there's no quantum Hall effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to measure just the top surface without doing any, without, you know, you can't cut the bottom surface off. I mean, it's still there, and, and it's still going to affect what you measure. So you, yeah. For example, you can do the current effect. Huh? You can do the current effect on the bottom surface. Okay, but that, that opens up another can of worms. I think I don't want to get into that. Yeah. Spin momentum locking in the in the edge state. Um, um, uh, well, yeah, in the sense that you know you just have one chiral mode and it has some spin. So yeah, the spin is going to be locked to the momentum. I mean, you know, I mean, when you say spin momentum locking, you know, when you think about the helical state, you know, you have spin momentum locking where the the right movers have up spin and the left movers have down spin, or maybe on the surface you have some uh, you know, thing where on your Fermi surface, the, the spin uh, is core, the direction, the where you are on the Fermi surface is coupled with the with spin. Well, here you just have, you just have this, and, and, and it's just going to be, you know, you know there's, there's some spin on that, and so in that sense it's locked. Okay. All right. So, um, so I want to, I want to uh, uh, say just a few, uh, uh, a few words. I only have a few minutes left, so, and I'm going to, I promised I would end on time, so. Um, so there's another symmetry you can break, um, which is uh, gauge symmetry. Okay, and uh, so that's exactly what happens when uh, you have superconductivity. Okay, and so what you can imagine doing is taking your surface, and instead of putting a magnetic material down on top of it, you can imagine putting a superconductor down on top of it. And so if you have a superconductor, then um, the, the electrons in, the, uh, in your topological insulator can sort of roam into the superconductor, and then they, they inherit par pairing correlations from the superconductivity, superconductor. So by putting on a, um, by, by sort of putting a superconductor in contact with your topological insula uh, insulator surface, you can proximitize the, um, the topological insulator to make it a superconductor. And so if you do that, then, then uh, there's a simple description. So, um, so let's just imagine that, that um, the, the topological in insulator inherits a pairing gap from the um, from the from the um, from the uh, bulk superconductor, and so then um, one can describe that. So we've we've seen um, you know the the sort of Bogolubov uh form formulation for uh, how one describes uh, 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 quasi particles in a superconductor, and so um, so uh, what you do when you do that is you make two copies of the Hamiltonian that you started with, sort of one for the particles and one for the holes. And I'm going to label those two copies by tau z, by a, a Pauli matrix tau z. And so then I have my original Hamiltonian, which is just uh, you know, Vf sigma dot p. Uh, and let's put a chemical potential in. So this is really minus, minus mu n. 
okay? And um, so, uh, but then uh, when you have a superconductor, um, uh, the, uh, the superconducting order parameter has a real and imaginary part which couple to tau x and tau y. Okay, so, uh, so, so the, uh, the superconducting order parameter, which is delta 1 plus i delta 2, I can think of that as the magnitude of delta times e to the i times the superconducting phase. Okay. So, um, so let's think about what we have here, um, because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting, um, because there's a sense in which this superconductor looks an awful lot like Nick's p plus ip superconductor. Okay, because um, so let's think about this. So um, so so now, of course, a, a p plus i p superconductor. You're talking about uh, spinless electrons. So for spinless electrons, you have a Fermi circle, and uh, you're pairing k with uh, minus k, and you have um, and then um, you know your 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 um, your pairing correlation, your 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 you know superconducting uh, 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 order parameter then is going to be some you know proportional to delta e to the i phi, and then it has to it since since it's um, it has to be uh, you have Fermi statistics it has to be anti-symmetric then it has to be odd under momentum. Okay, and so this is um, uh, so this is what happens if you have a spinless p plus ip superconductor. Now, a conventional superconductor is different. So, so, so this superconductor has all the magic that Nick talk you, told you about about when you have a, a vortex, you get a Majorana mode. Okay, um, a conventional superconductor. You really have you really have two Fermi surfaces. You have a Fermi surface for the up spins. And you have a Fermi surface for the downspins. Okay, so you have you have the uh, the downspins and the upspins, and there you're pairing you're pairing a uh, upspin electron at k with a downspin electron at minus k. Okay, and so uh, so then you can have uh, you know c k up. C minus K down is equal to delta. And that's something there you, you can have singlet pairing um, uh, uh, you know, between uh, you know, uh, K and minus K. But this requires twice as much Fermi surface as this. Okay? Now the topological insulator is really more like this case. Okay? But, um, uh, but there's a difference, which is that it doesn't require P wave. So, uh, so in the topological insulator, what you have is you have a single Fermi surface, but the spin is sort of rotating around like this, and so you have um, you have uh, you know so you, you have k up and uh, minus k down still, um, and so you can have you can induce superconductivity in this. Uh, P wave in this topological insulator surface with a time reversal invariant S wave superconducting order parameter. Okay. Whereas here, you need to have, in order to have a gap, you need to have a time reversal symmetry breaking P plus IP uh, order parameter. Okay. So, uh, so once you recognize the similarity between the superconducting state of the topological insulator and the superconducting state of the p plus ip superconductor, then that invites you to then think about uh, how you can engineer Majorana modes. Okay, and so um, and so I have a few minutes just to, to tell you about that, and I think I can do that. So, um, so you can imagine. Uh, so, um, so you can imagine trying to make a uh, a zero-dimensional 
uh, 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 on a bound state by, by putting a superconductor on the surface of my uh, topological insulator. And then um, I have a uh, you know, h over 2e vortex in my superconductor. Okay, And for the same reason that the h over 2e vortex bound a zero mode in, uh, in Nick's P plus IP superconductor, um, it uh, happens here as well. Okay, And it's actually uh, uh, an interesting problem to solve the uh, Bogolu you know, the Bogolubov degen equation for this with a um, zero mode. And this is actually um, something which, uh, for mu equals zero, was done um, uh, some time ago by uh, Jakiv and Rossi. I think that was in the, uh, I can't remember when that was, uh, 80s, early 80s, is that right? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but in any case, um, uh, but one can also, it turns out you can also solve it in a nice way for mu not equal to zero as well. Okay? And, um, uh, but in any case, it's possible to see explicitly that you get the uh, zero mode there. Now, this isn't the only way you can do it. There are other ways of engineering zero modes using topological insulators as well. Um, and so, uh, so uh, uh, let's um, uh, consider instead of. Um, so if mu is zero, you have a full gap in the bulk? I mean. Well, you always have a full gap in the bulk. The thing that you have at mu equals zero that you don't have when mu is not equal to zero is particle hole symmetry. And so, so, so Jakiv and Rossi saw, were, were able to have a, a, a um, very simple solution because they used the chiral symmetry. Okay, the unitary chiral symmetry, because they had both the, the, the superconducting particle hole symmetry and, and they, also had, they also had, you know, the, 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 basically it has particle hole symmetry. When, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so it's class BD1 instead of, in, instead of class D. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So another uh, uh, interesting problem you can think of is um, let's imagine that I have a 2D topological insulator, and so the 2D topological insulator has the uh, has the uh, has the edge states, okay, helical edge states, and and so just like in uh, in the three-dimensional surface, um, you can induce energy gaps. Uh, on this by lowering the symmetry. And in particular, you can induce a magnetic you can induce a magnetic gap by coupling this to some Zeeman field, for instance. Okay, that opens up an energy gap. You can also um, uh, open up an energy gap by coupling it to a superconductor. Okay, and um, so uh, so in both cases you have an energy gap on this side and an energy gap on this side, but they're kind of different. And this is a similar kind of domain wall problem, and one can show that there is a uh, a uh, you know a, a zero mode bound to this as well. Okay, and then let me show you one final one since I have two minutes left. Propagating, it's not propagating at all. It's a, it's it's zero dimensional. Oh, sorry, so the plane, two D plane is this way. Yeah, this is the two D plane. Yeah. And let me just show you one version. Let me uh, show you the version of this on the surface of a three dimensional topological insulator. So I can imagine now I have my. 3D TI, and then I can put a magnetic material and a superconductor now. Okay, and so now this is a kind of uh, interesting domain wall, and on this domain wall lives a chiral Majorana mode. Okay, and so this this is actually just like the edge of Nick's P plus IP superconductor, this chiral um, uh, chiral Majorana mode. And it's actually kind of interesting to think about this because you know in the P plus IP superconductor, your superconductor has to break time reversal symmetry. 
okay? But your, your vacuum on the other side of the boundary, it, you know, doesn't break time reversal. It's just the regular vacuum. It's time reversal invariant, okay? In this case, we have it sort of switched. The superconductor is time reversal invariant. Um, it's, the, it's the vacuum on the other side that's not a superconductor that breaks time reversal. You see, time reversal has to be broken somewhere because otherwise the chiral mode wouldn't know which way to go. Okay, but uh, in Nick's case, the time reversal symmetry is broken here. In my case, the time reversal symmetry is broken here. Okay, so it's three o'clock. I'm done. Yeah. So in the spinless case, the other pre the reason you have a marionite pressure here. Yeah, you have to solve a more complicated problem. So here, you end up solving a four-band problem. Even in this case, even in this case, you end up solving a four-band problem, and and uh, and so, yeah. So it's not it's not as simple a calculation as the uh, as the ca as the domain wall calculation I did for you, you know, yesterday or the day before. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say it again. Well, let me tell you one interesting way, and then, and then, and then uh, so, so what if you did the following? So, um, actually, let me, let me do it like this. So let's imagine we have a, um, a domain wall between up and down. So that carries a, uh, uh, a chiral Dirac fermion on it. And let me interrupt that with a superconductor. OK? And so now this uh, chiral, uh, uh, chiral Dirac fermion splits into two chiral Majorana fermions, which go around the opposite sides. Okay, because I have a chiral Majorana fermion here, I have another chiral Majorana fermion here, and it has to split in half. So I have C equals one here, which splits into C equals a half plus C equals a half. Okay, and so this turns it into a kind of interferometer for these, um, uh, uh, for these uh, Ma chiral Majorana edge modes. And in particular, you can ask, it's sort of a Z2 interferometer, because of course you can't just put any flux through a superconductor, but you can put a uh, H over 2E flux through a superconductor by having a vortex. And what that does is it changes the sign of the Majorana mode, of one of the Majorana modes relative to the other. And effectively, it changes your, you know, so if you think of your Dirac fermion operator, C dagger is gamma one plus I gamma two, it turns it into C, which is gamma one minus I gamma two. So it turns a particle into a hole. So which means that if you, if you bring a particle in here, it comes out as a hole. Okay, so that's one thing you could do, a transport uh, type uh, uh, measurement to probe these uh, chiral Majorana modes. Or you could have one that's shared by all of them, but yeah, okay. Yeah, but if I think, if I just blow this, Look, I would say that you have on the on the cube you have one surface that's bent into you exactly, know. Yeah. yeah. But then what happens to the Dirac? Well, then you have Dirac fermions on a surface, on a on, on on a sphere. But can they gap out? And can they gap out each other? Yeah. No. Because originally I have two Dirac holes up and bottom. Look, it, it, look, if your if your sur if your sphere has a finite size, of course it's going to be gapped. It's going to have a discrete spectrum. But if, it's, but if it's infinitely big, then it's just, the, you know, look, the, the surface of the, of the Earth is, is flat, right? You can't tell the difference between, the, you know, if the Earth was a cube, we wouldn't know it. <laughs> okay, we should take a break so that, uh, so that uh, we can uh, have a break before uh, Ari. All right. Yeah, sure.
was puzzled about this. Yeah. First of all, I didn't even know about Chakif and Rossi until like the mid 2000s or something. Well, I didn't, I didn't even know, know about, about it until I wrote this it's paper. Not a, not a, <laughs> really, yeah, it's not a very well known. Yeah, yeah. I think they were working in 3D with a Vortex line. 